going to uh, jump in. If you've got your Bibles, uh, you can grab your Bible. And, um, you know, if you've got a digital one, that's awesome. But I think there's something to say about just having your physical Bible that you do devotions with. I, I use both. I use the mobile app stuff all the time. Our Dreamers Church app has uh, mobile versions. But there's just something about underlining in your Bible and circling words and writing down notes and just marking it up that I think is special. But come on, let's let's pray today. Father, we thank you for this book. Lord, we thank you that it's living, it's active, God, that there's truth in here that can guide our life. Lord, there's truth in here that can walk us through every problem, every challenge. There's truth in here that defines my life, defines who I am, defines what I can do. God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this word. And we ask you now, would you speak to us through it? Lord, would you this book of dreams, God, would you use it to awaken something in our hearts and in our minds today as we just seek you. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. You can open up to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. We've been on a, a, a fun little journey here um, going through the book of Ephesians and just taking a look at it. And I want to tell you this um, this next Sunday, I'm really excited because we have uh, one of our, our friends is going to be here, uh, going to come speak, a special guest. Um, his name's Randy Allward. He was a big part of what uh, helped start um, many different things that we've seen throughout our nation, but Promise Keepers would be one of them, which was a kind of a movement that spread across uh, the nation of just men seeking God and uh, standing together in the 90s. It was pretty powerful, and uh, he also uh, founded and started uh, Maranatha Music, which has uh, impacted the worship industry over the last uh, 20 years in just a pretty massive way. And so he's going to be coming to speak and speak into um, uh, us, and I believe he's going to have a timely word. So that's next week. It's going to be awesome. And uh, today we're going to dive in, though, to the book of Ephesians. And uh, chapter 5 is kind of fun. We've been looking at these uh, different pictures that we see in the book of Ephesians, right? Week 1, had my bicycle up here, and we kind of talked about how a bicycle has many different functions, right? A, a bicycle can be used for transportation. It can be used for a hobby. They can hook it up to something, and it, it uh, can create electricity and energy. You can hook it up to a blender and start your own food truck. All kinds of things a, a bike can do, right? And uh, many different pictures that one thing can do. And, and the book of Ephesians is Paul writing to us and saying, hey, the church, there's a lot of pictures of the church. There's different things. The church is not a one-dimensional, simple little thing that this is all the church does and this is all that it's for. The, the, the church is something that's very specific, that uh, God has uh, many things for it to do. And so in chapter 1, we took a look at that. We talked about how it talks about how Jesus is preeminent in the church, that the church is all about Jesus. The church is all about his plan, his purpose, his will. And in chapter 2, we talked about how the church was like a temple being built and how Jesus was the chief cornerstone, right? And that it's being built into something. And each one of us, we're a brick in that building, meaning that, that Paul was saying, look, this, this building wouldn't be right if it was missing a brick right here. There would be a, a problem. There would be a problem with Dreamers Church if you weren't here, if you weren't functioning and, and being who you were called to be. And then he goes in and he says, the church is like a family, and in a family, we, we just stick together. We walk together. It's, 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 a, it's an important thing. Then in chapter 4, we talked about this last week. He talks about it being the body of Christ, that each one of us, not only are we a needed part, like a brick in the building, but we're actually an interconnected part of a body that if, if the heart's missing, we're all going to have problems, right? And if the hand's missing, the body's going to be very limited. And without you, the church is missing something, right? Paul's given us these different pictures that help us go, okay, I think I get it. I, I, I understand I understand what happens. You know, last night I watched as the, the corners for uh, UT Austin uh, weren't getting the job done and the whole team suffered uh, because of it, right? A little football illustration. And i uh, got to slip a few of those in. And as Paul's doing this, he's just taking normal things from around him. And he's going, okay, how can I help them understand their, how important they are? Paul's right into this group of people. We talked about the, the backdrop of this book is so unique because Paul's in prison, right? 
and he's he's actually on house arrest and he's chained to a, a guard and which I, I just can't imagine sometimes whenever I read scripture I like to understand what was going on like when I read the gospels I like to figure out why was why is there four different gospels and from what vantage point was each of them written right because it gives me a little bit of insight and helps me understand it and with Paul's letters when you st- stop and study what's going on, all of a sudden you have a new revelation because his choice of words are important, right? The things he he talks about are important. If I was chained right now in my house and and we were live streaming me in on the screen and my, my arm was chained to another prisoner, my ankle was chained, not to another prisoner, uh, but to, to a guard and my ankle was chained to them, my words would probably have some different... Uh, uh, meaning to them if I talked about freedom, right? Because you'd be looking at me going, wow, he's he's not free. That's 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 something different. When If I was in that situation and I was talking about the hardships of life, you'd go, man, that, that is a tough situation. And if I'd been like that for at least four years like Paul was, it would give me a different frame of reference. And so here's Paul. We're going to jump into chapter 5. And I love the beginning of, of chapter 5 because Paul just... Um, just makes this bold, audacious statement right out of the the gate. He says this in in chapter 5, verse 1. He says, be imitators of God. That's 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 a pretty detailed, um, that's a pretty tough one to follow, right? Just simply be an imitator of God. Look like Him, act like Him. And uh, Paul says, as dearly loved children and live a life of love, just as Jesus loved him, loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So Paul, here he is, he's in chains, and he's writing to these people in Ephesus. And these people are special to him because we talked about this a little bit, but if you're new, uh, I'll bring you up to speed. Paul had uh, he had visited there twice, and on his second journey to Ephesus, he stayed there for a little over two years. So he spent a total amount of time of almost three years in his past there. And those two years that he was there, he started this uh, this movement that broke out in the city and. People were just getting delivered and set free, and there was all kinds of idolatry worship and crazy stuff going on. And as Paul preaches the gospel, all of a sudden, just tons of people start coming to Christ. They start getting rid of all of their idolatry worship, so much so that it it literally changed the, the way the city was functioning. And Paul gets run out of town, and so now he's writing this letter, and he's in chains, and everyone would know that he's in chains for the gospel as he's writing this letter back to them. And he's framing this in, and then his challenge in chapter 5, he's going to begin to to show us uh, what the church is meant to look like. But before he frames this thought in, he says, hey, you guys, you need to be imitators of God. And even as uh, God loves us as, as uh, children, we're called to live a life worthy. I mean, live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. There's a life that you and I are meant to live that when people look at our life, we're meant to be different. We're meant to be unique. When people look at the way we live, if they really opened up our bank account statement and looked at the way we spend our money, if they if they really looked at uh, the way we spent our time and looked at our schedule, there should be something that's different about us. We shouldn't just be like the, the rest of the world, just living for ourselves and going, okay, what is my calling? What is my thing? But rather as the church, we're meant to be a body of believers that are giving our life to fulfill the great commission, to fulfill the, we have such a limited time here on earth before one day we're all going to be sitting in heaven. And at that point, we're not going to be able to look back and and go, man, uh, I want to go change this or change that. This is our moment right where we're at here, this time in our life for us to make a difference. And Paul's just reminding them of this. He's saying, you guys, you got to think about Jesus. Think about what he did. That he came and he he lived a perfect life, a a selfless life, and gave himself as something that the Bible says was a fragrant offering to God. It It was something special, what Jesus did. And he said, don't forget that because you're called to live the same life. Our life, our sacrifice, there should be something about who we are that, that really separates us from the world. And 
I know sometimes I have to sit back and sit down, even as a pastor. Uh, you know, Laura and I are just no different than the rest of you. We have challenges. We got four kids that we're, we're trying to get it right. We're trying to figure out, you know, how, how to raise them to serve God. We're trying to work uh, all my bad habits out of them and work Laura's good habits into them, right? And we're, we're just trying to be good parents. We're trying to, to, we have hobbies and desires in life, and we're trying to balance those and figure out, okay, God, what does it mean to live for you? What does it mean to say no to certain things and certain seasons and, and really focus on what you've called us for? And those are real pain points that all of us face. And Paul was writing to people just like us saying, you guys, I get it. I get the challenge you're going through. Like, life is tough. There's, there's so many things vying for your attention. There's so many things that, that uh, you could be doing. And, and Paul says, look, as you do it, just figure out what it means to live a life of love and to sacrifice some of your own desires. And then he jumps in and he begins to frame in another picture for us. And this picture is kind of fun because uh, it's one that I, I think most of us can understand. But he says, look, the church is meant to be the bride of Christ. And Paul begins to lay out some uh, language here that's uh, very interesting. In verse 22, I'm going to pick it up right there. Paul says, wives, submit to your husbands as it is to the Lord. Uh, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. So he's going to draw this parallel picture where he's like speaking kind of to the people in the church. And he's saying, okay, wives, you, you, here's, a, here's something that you need to understand. And then he's going to start addressing the men. And men often get excited about this because they're like, that's right, wives are going to submit. And then, and then Paul says, but men, just remember, you're supposed to die for her. You're supposed to do whatever it takes for her. And if I had to choose one of those, I would probably rather just submit to my wife. If I'm honest, it would just be easier. But, but Paul, Paul says, look, he says, he says, wives, there's a certain way you're meant to live in context of family, not in context of culture. Important to take note of that. He says, he says, wives, submit to your husbands. And then he goes on. He says, now as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Then he says, in verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her uh, to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or blemish, uh, but holy and blameless. In this way, same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, um, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. And uh, he goes on to talk about this, and it's interesting that Paul's instruction here is for husbands to love the wife, but wives to respect the husband. If we were doing uh, speaking on marriage and stuff today, I, I would stop and take a lot of time to talk about the way that God created man and woman different from each other and how in a context of marriage, women thrive off of feeling loved and men thrive off of feeling respected. But what's interesting is in this very moment, Paul says this. He says, I'm, I'm actually speaking of a greater revelation that you need to understand. And that is the church. So he's, he's talking about this picture of the church as a bride, but then he's giving context of how God loves you and I. God doesn't look at you and I and go, okay, I feel like I need to respect you. God says, I know what you're going to thrive off of. You're going to thrive off of love. And so God's illustrating this, that, that he loves us and he loves the church. But he says in the same way, he says, wives, you need to learn to respect and honor your husbands. He says in the same way, the church is meant to respect and honor God. Isn't that an interesting thought that we as a body of believers, what should make us unique is that going back to his opening statement here, which was to be an imitator of God, to to. Uh, to, to love others to, to the same way Christ gave himself for us to have that same mentality for you and I that we're meant to respect and honor God. Like what, what should mark this church is that all of us choose to live a life that really honors God. To honor means to give weight to something. It means to elevate it above 
other things. It's like this picture of a set of scales, right? And if you honor something, it, it, it goes up in its value. And I believe that that God's wanting us to get this picture that he sees us, that the church is meant to be this bride that, that he's excited about. God says, I'm, I'm coming back for a bride God's coming for, so the church isn't going to end in failure. The church is going to be something that reaches, I believe, that the ends of the earth. I believe the church is designed to be something that will reach Austin. Come on, there's there's a lot of great churches in Austin, and we're part of that uh, greater uh, Big C church. And I believe that God's going to use the church to reach our city, to do something great. But it's going to come through us making a decision as individuals to say, you know, the way I live my life, I really want God to feel like I respect him and that I honor him and that I elevate him, that I, that I follow and that I acknowledge that he is the leader in my life. When God tells me to live a certain way, I want to live according to this word. I don't want to live in a way that I think might be good. I don't want to run my business in a way that I go, oh, this would be the right. No, I want to look at the word of God and say, what principles do I need to put into place into my life so that the way I'm living, the way I'm raising my kids, that it brings honor to God and shows respect to him and his word. And as we begin to get a revelation of this, and we start reading through this and going, okay, God, you're choosing. God could choose any. Could have used any illustration. He could have thought of my bicycle illustration. I think that one should have made scripture. It was so good. But God said, no, you know what I want to do? I want to talk about marriage. I want to talk about this because there's something unique about it that's meant to bring revelation to you and I and help us to see one, the love that God has for his church. I mean, I, I remember when uh, Laura and I were engaged and uh, preparing to get married and, and just thinking about that season and what it felt like to, to be in love and what it felt like to be thinking about our, our wedding date and everything that was in front of us and just the excitement, the joy, the, all that. And God says, that's the picture I want you to think about. When you think of what I think about the church, I want you to think of God thinks of it like, like a husband that's going to be getting married to his bride. And that's how passionate he is about the church. The church is a big deal to him. The church is something that, uh, that he would place very high value on. And then he goes on in chapter 6. And I want to um, camp out here in chapter 6 for a, a, a little bit. Because last week we talked about how in the book of Ephesians, Paul gives three different postures that he, he talks about the believer and uh, he talks about how uh, the, the believer in, in one posture, he begins the beginning. Hold on a second, I'm just. He begins the beginning of chapter two, talking about how we're seated with Christ in heavenly realms. And then in chapter four, he starts talking about how uh, we're meant to walk a life that's worthy of the calling. But then in chapter six, he brings up this, this third posture. And I want to talk about it because in it he also reveals another picture of the church and that is the picture of standing and um, in Ephesians uh, chapter 6 it, starting in verse 10 it says finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might put on the whole armor of God that you and it's actually plural there so it's a, it's a really a Texas y'all right there he says so so that y'all will be able to stand against the schemes of of the devil. Paul's going to begin to give us these pictures of what it means to put on the full armor. And I want to remind you that that Paul's as he's writing this letter, he might even be right-handed attached his right hand to a guard and this guard might be just watching him as he's penning this letter for all we know and he's he's writing and he's looking at him going okay this guy this guy has a, a breastplate on he has a belt on what are the significant significant things he has that makes this guy a warrior right and he's going to draw these pictures in this moment and begin to lay it out and when you stop and think about the fact that he's in prison that's a pretty significant or in house arrest but that's a pretty, pretty significant picture for him to draw. As he begins to wrap this passage up and wrap this letter up, he goes, okay, the last thing I'm going to tell you is that you need to stand. 
There was just something inside of Paul that as he laid out all of this, he says, I want you to stand. And he's going to show us a picture of the church as the army. So he goes from bride to army. That's that's kind of like a big spread right there, right? Uh, uh, the illustration of getting married, and now he's got us in the middle of a battle zone. He says the picture of the church that I also see is that it's a that it's a bride, but it's also an army, and it's meant to be people that are prepared for war. And that war, the Bible says, is not uh, against um, a lot of the things that we might think we're warring against. Because he says that our battle's not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers and principalities in heavenly realms. And he uses this word here. He only uses it five times in all of his writings. And he says uh, that you, you'd be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, it's important for us to understand what Paul's uh, perception of the enemy was. This word schemes is the word noema. It's used uh, five times throughout all of Scripture, and it actually speaks of with something that comes against your mind, a predetermined thing that is, is used to shift your mindset. And so um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a predetermined attack on the mind and thoughts with an ill intent. And so Paul says, look, you need to be able to stand against the attacks on your mind. So it's important when we think of the, the armor and everything that we're meant to do, it's actually to protect our mind, our way of thinking, because the enemy doesn't have the ability to move my arm. The enemy doesn't have the ability to control me. The enemy has the ability to get into my mind. And if the enemy can get into my mind and convince me that he's bigger than me, then he is bigger than me. Because my perception becomes my reality. And that's why when uh, I look at my son and I tell my son to do something, he perceives dad's in charge and he does it. But I can speak to another kid, the same kid, your kid, and I can say don't do something. And that kid just looks at me and laughs and does whatever they do because I'm not a, a thing of authority in his life, right? And so Paul's saying that the enemy wants to come and get a hold of your mind. Now stop and think about this for a minute because all of us are in a different situation here today. All of us have different challenges. Uh, there's married people in the room. Each of your marriages are in different situations. Each of your finances are in different situations. There's single people in the room. Each of you are in a different moment, a different time. And yet the enemy has one tool that he uses, and it's the attack on the mind. And Paul says if you're going to stand, standing's not about taking a stand like in the natural. It's actually about getting control of your mind and saying to the enemy, look, enemy, I know you're going to come against me, right? The, the Bible says no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. You know what that means? It means there are weapons being formed against you. But it also means they're not going to prosper. That by design, the enemy doesn't have authority over your life. But we have to take captive these thoughts. That's how Paul words it to, uh, when he's writing to the Corinthians. But now as he's writing to these people in, in Ephesus, he words it a little bit differently. And he says that so that you can stand against these predetermined attacks on your mind. And he says, for we do not wrestle, verse 12, against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And then he says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you can be able to stand, uh, withstand the evil day. And having done all to stand, he says, keep standing. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Now he's going to give us some simple things that if we live by this, we're going to be prepared for when the enemy comes against us. What this tells me is that if the belt of truth, that by wearing truth, I protect my mind. Because remember that the attack was not against the waistline. The attack, well, my, my attack is on the waistline, but uh, the uh, lately... <laughs> Can I get a witness? And, uh, but he, he's actually saying, look, the reason that we wear the belt of truth is because the enemy's going to come against our mind. 
So the reason I want to walk in truth and integrity is because if I don't, I'm going to give the enemy room to come against my mind in a way I don't want to. He goes on, he says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness means to be in right standing with God. The reason I want to be in right standing with God is so the enemy can't get into my mind, so that he can't start taking control and, and, and getting room there. He says, he says that your feet, uh, you should have shoes on your feet, having the readiness given for the gospel of peace. That the reason that I want to walk in peace, the reason I want to be sharing the gospel is to protect my mind. That if I'm giving glory to God in everything that's happening to me and everything that I'm going through, I'm going to protect my mind from the enemy coming against me. He goes on and, and he says, look, you got to put on the, the helmet of salvation. Why? Because the enemy wants to attack your mind. What is the helmet of salvation? It's me remembering that I'm saved, that I'm a new creation. You know how important it is for you to get up each day and make a declaration over your life? That the old has passed away, that the new has come, that God has plans for my life. They're good plans, plans not to harm me, but give me a hope and a future. That it is important for me that the enemy's going to come and say, Paunch, your life doesn't have purpose. Paunch it, you missed it. Remember that one time? And remember that other time? And that other, and he'll keep going through as many times as he can to get me to start coming into agreement with his way of thinking. It's interesting how the enemy is so good at bringing up our sin. He's so good at bringing up our flaws. He knows our name, but he doesn't choose to call us by it. He calls us by our sin and tries to get us to identify with our weakness, with our failure. And so you get up and you say, man, my marriage just isn't what I wish it was. And man, I, my, my life isn't going the direction that I thought it was. And my, my finances, oh, I'm a failure, that person. Or the, and we start coming into agreement with things when God says, put on the helmet of salvation. That who I am in Christ is I'm a new creation. I'm a new person. The old has passed away. The new has come. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. That I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I mean, you got to learn to make a declaration over your life because the enemy is making declarations. The enemy is so good. He's a student. That's why I don't like him. Just kidding. <laughs> Students are awesome. Sidebar. Put on the helmet of salvation. Then he says this, take on the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So he's looking at this guy and he goes, man, you know what this guy has? He has only one weapon. Everything else is a defensive mechanism. So by walking in truth, it's, it's a defensive mechanism. By walking in righteousness, it's a defensive mechanism, right? And, and by putting on the helmet of salvation and reminding myself, it protects me. But I do have one weapon. And only one weapon listed here. It's in, then further illustrated in a minute. But that, that weapon is the word of God. That the word of God is like a sword. That if I know how to use the, the word of God, then not only can I resist the enemy with my shield of faith and do, am I protected with this different armor, but I can actually begin to go somewhere now. I can begin to take ground if I know what the word of God says. If I know the declaration over my life, it shifts everything. If I know these, these, these promises, these principles. So many people, I, I talk to them and I go, are you declaring the word of God over your life? It's a weapon. It's a sword. Oh, but pastor, my, my finances, if you only knew. I, don't, I know the guy that created the coins. I know the guy that's in charge of everything. He, he's, he's doing just fine financially. And so I don't have to worry about your exact financial situation. I have to come into agreement with what the word of God says over your life. And if I can begin to do that, I can wage war against the enemy. So when he's, when he's coming at me and, and you're feeling things like anxiety and fear, right? If we were honest this week, probably all of us had moments of anxiety and fear where just a wave hit us, right? Where we were like, man, no one knows what's going on there. 
And we all like to think we're the only one. I'm the only one. Oh, Lord, you're definitely not because I'm at least number two. Anxiety, fear, insecurity, Ponch, you'll never be good enough. You'll never be able to do what, what those dreams in your heart are to do. I mean, if he's, if he's coming against me, he's coming against all of us. If he's coming against Paul, Paul's not writing this from the vantage point of never experiencing it. He's saying, you guys, I understand what's going on. And this is how the enemy works. So you've got to know the word of God. Can I challenge you? to read your Bible in this season as we're, this is a great, you know, for me personally, three times a year, I have these reset moments. One's the beginning of the year. We kick off the year with a 21-day fast in 2020. It's going to be awesome. And it's a great time to get a fresh word, a fresh focus. And then for me, usually in May is another time where I just slow down and kind of refocus for the summer, but then towards the end of August and into September is where I really take another moment to refocus, recalibrate my life, look at my devotional life, look at my prayer life and go, okay, God, I want to go deeper than I was last month. And one of the ways that we do that is by getting into the word of God and allowing the word of God to get inside of us. And it just shifts everything. And so when the enemy comes against me, much like Jesus did in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, I use the Word of God. So when the enemy starts bringing fear, I say, look, God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So, so enemy, I know what the Word says about me, and I have power. I have power in my words to make a declaration, to move mountains, to shift things, of love that I have, the, even in the middle of pain and problems, I can still walk in love. I can still have a sound mind. And the enemy wants to come and convince us differently, but we have the word of God. And then Paul says the, the last thing. He says this, and a lot of times we talk about the, the six pieces of armor. But can I give you a seventh piece that I think Scripture real clearly illustrates? And that's the, he continues this, and he says, and pray in the Spirit at all times, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with uh, perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me that words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare boldly as I ought to. Can I tell you, your mouth is a weapon? Because your mouth is the tool that God gave us to come into agreement with him. It's the tool that he gave us to declare his goodness over our problems. It's the tool that he gave us to worship. The Bible says when we worship and lift high the name of Jesus, the atmosphere shift. Our mouth is such a powerful tool, such a powerful tool. If we understand it, we can get up in the morning and we can begin to speak in tongues. We can begin to, to worship. We can begin to sing. We can begin to declare scriptures as you're going through your day and something hits you and, 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 and sidetracks you. Rather than coming into agreement with that and going, man, it's just going to be another bad day. That coworker of mine. No, it's an opportunity for me to begin to declare the word of God over my coworker, say, God, you got a plan for his life, and it's a good plan, and right now he's walking out a bad one, so I need your good plan to come into existence for him right now, God. I need blessing and favor. I need him to get saved because he's on the pathway to hell, and he's taking it out on me, right? I mean, there's ways that you can begin to pray for people around you, for your neighbors. God's given us each a mouth. He's given us the ability to worship. And I think Paul's just wanting us to see as he's laying out the pictures of the church, he's also trying to help us become what we're called to be because we are the church. When he talks about the bride of Christ, he's talking about us collectively. When he's talking about the army, he's talking about us collectively. And if I don't know how to use the word of God, it's going to be problematic in the army, right? If you don't know how to use the word of God, it's going to be problematic in this army and our ability to move forward. And so all of us, all of us, God's given these tools, these abilities to. 
And I just think for us to come into agreement over our life, I don't, I don't know what challenges, I'm going to have the band come up. I don't know what challenges you're facing, but I am confident I've yet to sit down with anyone in 20 years of pastoring and found someone that didn't have a challenge. I've yet to sit down with someone that, that wasn't trying to overcome the voice of the enemy somewhere in their life. I've yet to sit down with someone that had just, the enemy had given up on them. It said, whoa, this one's just way too tough. E even look at Job. Job is like the most legit dude, right? He's got everything figured out. And the enemy is trying to come after you. think the enemy would have given up on Job. I mean, he even said, this one won't. And yet he was still trying. The enemy's out to get you. There's a real enemy of our soul. But we have real weapons. We have ability to sing the praises of God. I, I want to sing this song. This is how I fight my battles again. Because there's just... There's just something about it. I've been, for the last couple months, I've been listening to this in my devotional time. And I just start singing this song. And the first time I heard it, it actually annoyed me. I was at a conference, and they were singing, this is how I fight my battles. And I kept going, how? <laughs> in my mind. Because I just walked in. I just in total, I showed up late. And I walked in, and uh, they're singing, this is how I fight my battles. I'm like, oh, cool. How? And I kept, and then I was like, oh, I get it. Like by worshiping God. This is how slow your pastor is at times. <laughs> to give you hope. And then all of a sudden it hit me and it was like this revelation. That's right. That's how I fight my battles. I just I just worship you, God. The enemy has the enemy flees. Resist the enemy and he'll flee. That's what James says. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. So right now, let's stand to our feet, and I would love for us to just make a decision to say, I'm going to come near to God.